We do um, pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. Um, we acknowledge that they have long standing relationships with this territory, which remains unceded. Um, we, we pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all the nations across Canada who, pay, uh, who call Canada, uh, Ottawa home. And we also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers that are both young and old um, and honor their courageous leaders past, present, and future. And particularly as a university, this is something that is an ongoing work that we have as, as educators um, to be raising these issues that, to sort of stay with the trouble, I guess, with, with uh, um, Donna Haraway. <laughs> um, I apologize for my voice. It's this very unusual feeling of going to a conference and you, you starting to lose your voice when you scream at a restaurant like last night. It was very nice to, to have that sort of feeling of being together with your colleagues. Um, and um, I want to, before we start, to remind everyone um, thank, and, and thank everyone to leave your notes also on Miro, which is um, the, plat the whiteboard that we have established um, for the conference. Um, it's uh, actually a great um, um, web um, address that Rachel created. It's tinyurl.com dash smartification. So it's easy to find. Um, yeah, so today we will um, start the second day and um, the last day of the conference um, with an um, amazing keynote speaker. We're very happy to have uh, Shannon Matron with us. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us today in person, but regardless, we're very, very thrilled to have you um, with us uh, via Zoom. Um, and I'm Sure, and I know that Shannon has followed the presentations last yesterday and, and also um, the exhibition opening, and uh, it was uh, nice to see her um, engaging as well. So I'm really looking forward to, to her thoughts, um, uh, maybe per also reflecting on these. So Shannon Metron is a professor of anthropology at the New School for, research, uh, for Social Research uh, in New York. And um, she combines um, her uh, work um, uh, with urban studies, critical data studies, media and information studies and many more. And as an anthropologist myself, um, I really appreciate the sort of out of the box thinking and doing. Um, in her most recent um, book, A City is Not a Computer, she looks critically at the various ways in which urban technologies and computational models in the form of urban design or policy shape and often limit engagements with the city in, in quite specific ways. Um, and one could then, and we have sort of seen that yesterday too, um, think of this uh, notion of the city as computer also um, in, 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 in ways that it turn, in ways that it transforms these place-based place knowledge ways um, to information processing also in the sense of the rural, what would that look like? What would be the rural as computer? Is that perhaps a provocation for us? Um, Shannon's work is so expansive and her website is an absolute joy to just um, go through. So I highly encourage you to, to, to check it out. Um, and I also really appreciate that she um, doesn't, doesn't only um, uh, um, provide this powerful critique of these technical renderings, of our places of processes of knowledge, but also reminds us to, to look at these other forms of, of intelligences, these urban intelligences, such as the public library. And we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more about this today. So Shannon, welcome to the symposium. And um, we look forward to your talk. Dana, I'm not sure if she has co-hosting rights. So maybe you wanna check um, before we start. It looks like I do. I, I'm able to share my screen. So thank you very much, Masha, for the really lovely introduction. And thanks to everybody, to Orit, uh, the artists um, who shared their work on Wednesday night, to all the panelists from yesterday. It was really stimulating conversation. I saw lots of really lovely synergies between them, many of the presentations. And as Masha said, I'm really sorry I can't join you in person. Um, uh, it's a really difficult year for many people. Um, I'm kind of juggling two administrative jobs right now and some family health crises, which had me out of town for most of um, last week. And into or the early part of this week, which made additional travel pretty difficult right now. But I'm glad to be joining you virtually. Uh, so let me make sure this is playing. So do you see my slides full screen? Okay, great. All right. 
So as Masha predicted, and as I probably uh, spilled the beans on Twitter, I am going to be talking a bit about addition, uh, kind of um, other knowledge institutions, specifically libraries and archives. Um, and the title, Homegrown Tech, Local Knowledge, How Libraries Support, Supplement, and Subvert Smartness. The past two weeks have offered countless examples of the volatility of connectivity. Russia has blocked Facebook, and Facebook and Google have blocked RT, the Russian state-controlled television network. The reciprocal restrictions have embroiled Twitter and TikTok and Twitch, too. State media inside Russian borders are a propagandistic echo chamber. The severing of ties within the global internet has cultivated different epistemological and political universes, economic ones, too. Russian banks have been blocked from using SWIFT, the global system enabling bank transactions, but some speculate that the government is using cryptocurrencies to circumvent the sanctions. <clears throat> the past two years have illuminated disconnections and misconnections that are the consequence of immediate political strife, but of decades, if not centuries long, systemic neglect and festering political um, strife. From health and electoral mis misinformation to inequitably distributed high-speed internet to surveillance technologies abused by militarized police forces, these are among the broken and exploited networks of our superimposed political, public health, and racial justice crises. During this period, we've seen plenty of smart technologies, which were pitched just a few years ago as means to individual convenience and efficiency, repositioned as tools for public health and public safety, or as Orit Halpern argued on Wednesday evening, as means of managing crises and averting catastrophe. <clears throat> In his book, Too Smart, How Digital Capitalism is Extracting Data, Controlling Our Lives, and Taking Over the World, Jathan Sadowski argues that something is smart when it's embedded with digital technology for data collection, network connectivity, and enhanced control. But there's an ideology embedded in these pursuits, too. Um, Sadowski proposes that smart tech advances the interests of corporate technocratic power and over other values like human economy, or excuse me, human autonomy, social goods and democratic rights. It's also driven by, oops, there it is, driven by the dual imperatives of digital capitalism, extracting data from and expanding control over potentially everything and everybody. A global pandemic, racial unrest and hostility generated by growing political factionalism legitimated the expansion of smart systems. <clears throat> Yet amidst all this extractive, disruptive, destructive algorithmization, there flourished an alternative technological imaginary, one that prioritized human autonomy, social goods, and democratic rights, the very things that Sadowski says tech, smart technology kind of subverts or undermines. Um, this other vision took many of the same technological technologies marshaled for smartness and redeployed them to advance instead public knowledge. I've had the pleasure of seeing many of these initiatives firsthand. For the past two decades, I've studied and worked with public libraries, and I've been honored to serve for the past few years as the president of the board of the Metropolitan New York Library Council, an organization that shares resources, designs software, provides funding, and facilitates learning that serves several hundred libraries, archives, and other knowledge institutions throughout the New York City metropolitan area. And every few months in each of our board meetings, I hear from my colleagues at the city's public academic, school, museum, and hospital libraries, and from adjacent digital equity advocacy organizations about how the failures and injustices of this tumultuous era have spurred them to action. I've heard of knowledge institutions becoming COVID test sites, curating repositories of credible public health information, banding together to provide emergency resources to underserved school children, and creating pandemic oral history collections. But what I'm going to focus on here now are how these knowledge institutions and organizations have also cultivated new digital ecologies. They've built technologies and data sets, promoted their critical use, even contributed to the construction of digital infrastructures, all of which we typically assume are the purview of corporations and states. What distinguishes these projects are their ethos and scale and epistemological um, telos. Rather than smartness, they prioritize local intelligences, plural. Rather than convenience and efficiency they, and profit, they center privacy, accessibility, consent, and justice. 
rather than aiming for scalability and universality, this idea of the copy paste city we heard about yesterday, they are universal visions of utopia. They respond to often ungeneralizable community needs and values. I should also say that I could not get this, my printer to work this morning in my office, so I am reading from my phone, which might be why I'm a little bit halting and staring off the screen a bit too much. So at Metro, the Metropolitan New York Library Council, we built an open source digital collections repository called Archipelago, which has been adopted by museums, libraries, and other institutions across the country. We've accepted nearly two million US dollars in funding from the American Rescue Plan Act and distributed it to local institutions to support digital inclusion, to increase digital resources for school libraries aiming to re-engage re students after the pandemic or in the midst of a continuing pandemic, and to promote library and museum collaborations. Our grants are supporting the creation of a digital art program, a teen tech hub, tech-focused bookmobiles, exterior wireless access points, um, and mobile hotspot loan programs. We're working with the city's knowledge institutions to create an open source learning management system for use in library-based public education programs. After we had a few board meetings, we were talking about how our reliance on Zoom and Slack and all of these soft proprietary software, and given the increase in library programming throughout the pandemic, there was discussion that why don't we build kind of essentially a public source or an open source um, public interest um, learning management system. So unlike most existing LMSs, including Canvas and Blackboard, with which some of you might be familiar, which surveil users and monetize their data, our platform is designed to prioritize privacy, anonymity, intellectual freedom, and digital equity. We've hosted hundreds of programs on censorship and activist archivy and abolitionist and decolonial knowledge work. Metro is partnering with the Internet Archive, Library Futures, and DWeb to curate an event series on the distributed web, or what some call Web3, to reclaim the discourse from the crypto and NFT folks, and to help cultural workers understand the promises and risks, including its potential uses for distributed storage, um, the promotion of digital or of data privacy, and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, moderation, as well as its environmental, legal, and ethical implications. We're building a library of digital equity, inclusion, and justice, a repository of resources about these subjects, and with Colin Reinsmith, establishing a new digital equity research center that will emphasize community-based and participatory methods to address local digital, digital, sorry, digital equity challenges. And to aid those efforts, we're soon hiring a community engagement specialist who can work with our staff and the local libraries to design inclusive, locally responsive processes of engagement. There's a lot of smart stuff happening here, but not as a means of asserting and amassing technocratic power or monetizing data. Each of these initiatives gathers, organizes, and freely distributes intelligence as a social good that supports autonomy, inclusion, and democracy. Those who study, design, market, and supply smart cities and other datafied geographies rarely think of them in relation to existing knowledge infrastructures like libraries and archives. Six years ago, I published a piece about libraries as repositories of local spatial data and as potential advisors and exemplars for cities and other administrative bodies as they consider how to responsibly manage civic technologies and the data generated by and deployed within smart terrains. In this piece, I quoted novelist Zadie Smith who argued that librarianship embodies a different kind of social reality, which by its very existence teaches a system of values beyond the fiscal. I continued, those values include access and accountability, a balance between openness and privacy, a commitment to preservation and security. And because librarians uphold those noble values on often on shoestring budgets, without the mentorship of angel investors or tech accelerators, they tend to develop a healthy skepticism about technology and even about their own fundamental ideals. They oppose the ruthlessly efficient, behaviorist, techno-liberal city, which prioritizes, excuse me, which prioritizes innovation, uh, driven obsolescence, exclusive contracts, and monetization of user data. Librarians on the Planning Commission will be the ones to ask why should procurement agreements favor platform providers rather than the citizens who contribute data. Archivists will ask about the racial imbalances in data harvesting and push for anonymous and secure preservation of public records. Together, they can be stewards of equity, discretion, interoperability, resilience, and respect for the past. Real wisdom rather than proprietary smarts. 
Then in my 2021 book, A City is Not a Computer, I started off with two chapters about smart cities. The first focused on the urban dashboard as a crystallization of smart epistemologies and ideologies. And the second examined how the metaphor of the city as computer, many of which we discussed yesterday, or city as platform, or city as operating system, or as Arit has ex examined, city as test bed, sorry, excuse me, test bed, has ontological, epistemological, and operational, methodological, phenomenological, and political implications. In other words, these computational metaphors shape how we conceive of and thus plan, design, equip, administer, maintain, and live in relation to our cities. The final half of the book then aims to expand these um, understandings of smartness by offering other ways of conceiving urban intelligence. First, through the library and other knowledge institutions, and second, through acts of maintenance, repair, and care. I aimed to position the library as a potential key agent within and a sanctuary from the logics and politics of smart urbanism. In other words, I wrote, I want smart city people to care more about libraries. But today I push it even further again for the purposes of our conference. Um, anyone thinking critically and responsibly about a range of datafied terrains from smart cities to smart farms, to fisheries, to forests, anyone analyzing smartness writ large could benefit from imagining an, the actual or potential role of libraries and other, lo, sorry, other local knowledge institutions as partners in participatory design, as sources of critical digital and algorithmic and infrastructural literacy, as models of ethical data management and tech development, as digital sanctuaries, as epistemological filters, as privacy trainers, as repositories of civic data, as champions of open access materials and public interest technologies. Joachim Schopfil acknowledges other affinities. He proposes that public libraries cultivate smart services, smart people, smart governance, and smart places. In what follows, I'll highlight six roles uh, that libraries play in supporting, supplementing, and at times subverting smartness. Roles they could play even more broadly and ambitiously with greater social recognition, staffing, and funding. So first, we have libraries functioning as platforms for the ad advancement of smart development and the nurturing of smart citizens. As Dale Leorke and Daniel Wyatt note in their book, Public Libraries in the Smart City, libraries are increasingly positioning themselves as innovation hubs of, um, of the new economy, supporting entrepreneurial activity and the skills required to thrive in a digital future. They're conscripted into smart city narratives, which has both reinforced and revitalized their importance to their cities and imposed new expectations and pressures. Leorke and Wyatt provide examples from Singapore, Australia, and Scandinavia, where libraries have been and often typically well financially supported, but also have been explicitly written into their cities or nations, smart city or national digital infrastructure initiatives. They're meant to support lifelong learning as citizens retool for an expanding digital knowledge economy. I find that libraries can, um, continuing relevance and persistent value is commonly sold to city officials in economic and entrepreneurial terms. Libraries as resources for job seekers, libraries as small business and tech incubators, libraries as co-working spaces for digital laborers, libraries as inst instruments of economic uplift. Smart aligned libraries are also expected to facilitate patrons interactions with increasingly automated government services and to introduce patrons to new technologies. Austin's beautiful library has a new technology petting zoo, as you can see on the left. And Columbus's library features a smart mobility hub with a smart kiosk and a variety of mobility modalities to help uh, the city learn how people move from place to place. The Chula Vista Public Library's Smart, education, uh, smart City Education Center in California allows children to explore renewable energy technologies, and Wichita's libraries allow patrons to interact with new smart city technology, like, this is kind of questionable, gunshot detection sensors, sensors that is. Both Seattle's and Washington, D.C.'s public libraries feature spaces for government agencies, too. For the past several years, <clears throat> Researchers at the University of Albany's Center for Technology and Government, in partnership with the American Library Association and with support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, have been studying the role of public libraries in engaging citizens in smart, inclusive, and connected communities. They found that most local governments, 97%, think public libraries can play an important role in developing smart communities. And their conceptions for those roles, while varied, often focus on access. 
libraries as providers of free access to high speed internet, computers, and in some cases, advanced technology like this kind we'd find in a maker center, for instance, 3D printers, laser cutters, etc. Such thinking, information studies scholar Daniel Green explains, exemplifies the access doctrine, a belief that the problem of poverty, and I would add other social ills, can be solved through the provision of new technologies and technical skills, giving those left out of the information economy the chance to catch up and compete. Yet the access doctrine also promises redemption to those providing the access. The invention of the digital divide in the Clinton era, Green proposes, provided a sense of mission and urgency to what otherwise appeared to be mere technology provision or, scales or skills training. Noting the rising tech industry's political and economic might, uh, public institutions like schools and libraries adopted tech's bootstrapping mentality to prove their continued relevance and, and viability. The access doctrine thus proceeded and continues to reinforce the techno solutionist promises of the smart city. Green's access doctrine involves access not only to hardware and software and infrastructure, but also to the critical skills necessary to use it effectively and thoughtfully. And this brings us to our second function of the smart library, the cultivation of digital smarts. Not only technical skills, but also critical literacies. Sure, librarians can teach patrons how to search databases, create resumes, code websites, um, produce podcasts, make maps, and change the privacy settings on their smartphones. Yet particularly in this age of misinformation, librarians have recognized the great importance of providing critical framing for these skills and for the resources in their collection. <clears throat> librarians have long embraced critical information literacy which involves examining resources to better understand how they're produced, presented, and valued, and how the institution of the library itself, its political history, its classification systems, its institutional structure, and so forth, shapes the ways that knowledge acquires and represents power. As I propose in a city as not a, com as not a computer, we can supplement information literacy with media literacy, which examines how information or knowledge is given form and data literacy, which encourages, encourages, that is, patrons to think about data's provenance, its origin, custody, and ownership, and the very fact that a lot of the data are made um, uh, rather than simply passively extracted from the world. Then there's algorithmic literacy, which proposes that we should be aware of how algorithms shape everything from our search results to our Amazon recommendations to who is deemed high risk by a policing platform or a mortgage broker or a flood risk assessment, as we heard yesterday. And infrastructure literacy, which encourages us to think about the cables, satellites, and modes of distribution through which information teaches us, reaches us, that is, and bypasses marginalized populations. Finally, if we add digital justice, it adds an ethical imperative to our critique. It reminds us that the above questions are not merely academic of academic concern, but are a matter of access, participation, ownership, and power, particularly for disenfranchised communities. These various literacies can be modeled in, a, in consultation over a physical or virtual reference desk. There are several organizations and initiatives dedicated to preparing librarians to discuss these critical concerns with their patrons. The Library Freedom Project, for instance, is a partnership among librarians, technologists, attorneys, and privacy advocates that offers workshops on surveillance threats and privacy rights, responsibilities, and strategies. The Digital Privacy and Data Literacy Project teaches NYC library staff how information travels and is shared online, what risks users commonly encounter online, and how libraries can better protect patron privacy. The DPDLP wanted to translate its pedagogy for patrons too, and it decided to experiment with a new modality, an exhibition. In 2018, in partnership with the Metropolitan New York Library Council, which you've heard about already from me, and New York City's three library systems and the mayor's office for the chief of the chief technology officer, my colleagues Greta Byram, Aaron Davis Anderson, and I commissioned 10 local artists to create site-specific artworks in branch libraries distributed uh, throughout the boroughs of New York City. The artist's work, which included an installation about race and surveillance, a workshop inviting teenagers to deconstruct the logics of targeted advertising, a series of tech liberation protest signs by Mimi Unawaha, which you can see in the top left here, and a Wi-Fi blocking Faraday cage by American artists, reached out to communities that are often digitally marginalized and at risk of harm from predatory surveillance systems. 
We could also look to the Mozilla Foundation's glass room, which I visited in New York with my students and again in Berlin. And it operates on a similar premise. It adopts, it, sorry, it adopts an Apple Store uh, aesthetic to display art, design, and tech objects that explore data, privacy, and other on our relationships with the, with the technologies and platforms we live, we, sorry, we use in our everyday lives. Quite a few of the public and academic libraries I've visited have dedicated gallery space, or they can carve out a corner for some type of an, uh, a kind of an ad hoc exhibition which allows them to feature artwork from the community, thus recognizing these aesthetic forms as critical components of local knowledge. Or they can use the space for participatory and pedagogical projects like those I've described here that support the informational mission of the um, institution. Librarians can bring these critical questions to bear in guiding patrons through the selection and analysis of, of resources or the creation of new ones. And this brings us to our third function of the smart library as local data repositories. Toronto's public library was volunteered as a public data hub for Keyside, the would-be smart city that Alphabet, otherwise known as Google, was planning to construct, which you might have known folded uh, about two years ago now. The Toronto Regional Board of Trade proposed that the library, a trusted, neutral third party, could host the development's data as part of a Toronto data hub. Library spokesperson Anna Maria Critchley told the Star that the library was a fitting and willing partner. Quote, public libraries are defenders of digital privacy and have expertise in data policy and information management. Yet, given the complexity of the issues and the expertise and consultation that would be required to inform the work, she said, the library would absolutely require extra resources. <clears throat> Critchley's caveat reflects the complicated roles and compromised positions libraries often hold in this age of new age of digital media and networked urbanism. Libraries can support their cities and the municipalities corporate and tech partners in expanding digital access. They can promote digital skills and critical digital literacies and environmentally sustainable practices. And they can facilitate the launch of startups and other forms of digital entrepreneurship. As in the cases of Singapore and Toronto, libraries can also serve as eth an ethical concession, a digital governance and urban, I'm sorry, let me start it over. Libraries can also serve as an ethical concession, a smokescreen, an otherwise controversially invasive, oppressive, discriminatorily digital governance, sorry, discriminatory digital governance and urban development projects. Yet in order to serve such roles, libraries in most parts of the world would absolutely require other resources. Yet some data sets are more, or, sorry, are more homegrown, cultivated specifically for public consumption, and their library stewards play a role in the data's creation and curation. Chattanooga's and Boston's libraries, for instance, serve as repositories or trusts for their city's public data. Spokane, Washington has a community data coordinator who liaises between the city government and the library. In Brooklyn, meanwhile, the Greenpoint Library and Environmental Education Center, which you see on the right, which opened just very recently, draws on decades of lived embodied experience in the neighborhood's toxicity. Greenpoint is the home of a few Superfund sites. It was a site of oil spills. So it's drawing all that on that lived experience of environmental injustice, injustice that is, as it supplements its local print and electronic resource collection with local environmental data, oral histories about environmental injustice and activism, and indigenous knowledge about the ecology as well. Prepared for the aforementioned, prepared with that is the aforementioned critical frameworks, librarians and their patrons can together curate or care for data more responsibly too. So those data, those data respect the lives and environments they represent, and so they can ultimately prove more useful for members of their local communities. As Trevor Owens, the head of digital content management at the Library of Congress, told me a few years ago, libraries could become a kind of middle ground for civic data in initiatives. That is, the libraries should be spaces where anyone can learn about the data that are being collected about them or about their communities, and also learn about how they can use those data themselves <clears throat> and have a voice in how they're collected, managed, and used. The Pittsburgh-based Civic Switchboard Project has heeded this call. They work with various communities to establish their local libraries as data intermediaries, connecting data publishers, data users, and other members of the local data ecosystem, universities, nonprofits, community organizers, etc who then join forces to enhance data quality, provide feedback mechanisms to publishers, and build tools that enable broader data use. 
Many libraries also include facilities and supplies for communities to make media of their own, film and recording studios, uh, to printing workshops, to computer and citizen science labs. This brings us to our fourth function of the smart city. The library is a platform for local media making. UDI in Helsinki, which opened in late 2018, boasts enviable production facilities. As local newspapers are brought up and uh, are, are bought up, that is, and summarily gutted by publishing conglomerates and private equity firms, specifically in the United States, and I imagine in Canada too, these are precisely the kinds of businesses that make bloodless data-centered decisions. As all this is happening, some libraries, or excuse me, some mastheads, newspapers, magazines, etc., are revived in their local libraries. The new library in Charlotte, North Carolina offers space to the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative. University libraries, meanwhile, often encompass their university presses, infusing the publishing enterprise with their capacious appreciation for multiple forms of knowledge production, their prioritization of access, and in some cases, an appreciation for experimentation with the forms in which knowledge is materialized and distributed. Technologist and, BBC, and former BBC executive Matt Locke has envisioned a public media stack. He wonders, how would our digital networks look and function differently if they weren't funded, if they weren't, that is, funded by venture capital and focused on likes and hits and attention grabbing polarizing content? What if instead they were designed to foster discovery and critical analysis? Locke held his first summit, sorry, his first summit, that is, at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, which suggests that libraries could and perhaps should play a role in envisioning and supporting such a system. Fifth, we have libraries using smart technologies to aid with the description, classification, storage, retrieval, discovery, and creative repurposing of collection materials and the provision of library services. Sensors can monitor visitor flow and building systems. Radio frequency identification or, or RFID technology can allow for the tracking of materials and thus aid in circulation, providing efficiencies for both staff and patrons. Some librarians using compact storage have deployed robots to shelve and retrieve those materials, which then become kind of a spectacle for people visiting the building, to maybe even a learning opportunity to learn about robotics. Others use bots or voice assistants to field common service inquiries, to supplement read-alongs, or to provide accessible services for elderly patrons or individuals with disabilities. You might be familiar with the Dynamic Order Project at the Sitterwerk Art Library in St. Gallen, Switzerland, where patrons can reshelve the RFID tagged books as they please, and any type of kind of creative format to create spo po spine poetry, to curate mini collections, to cultivate chromatic, um, um, uh, chromatic um, clusters, that is. And each night, a mobile reader scans the stacks and updates the catalog. Myriad other institutions from the Frick Art Library, uh, Art Reference Library, to the Getty Research Institute Library, to the Library of Congress, have used machine learning to automate description and allow for new forms of discovery within their collections. Such initiatives have turned their collection themselves into data sets, ripe for analysis about what lives on the shelves or in the archival boxes. Since 2020, the Meta Lab at Harvard has been examining what they call curatorial agents, that is, the use of machine learning to allow for new forms of engagement with museum and library collections. I wrote a piece for the project's program about how those smart technologies can be used in institutional critique to allow for the assessment of the biases and silences and ideologies embedded in the breadth of a collection. I propose that these tools could also be enlisted in self-reflexive critique about the, the very use of artificially intelligent technologies themselves. Tools developed and commonly deployed in marketing, policing, and defense for the purposes of targeting and cr criminalization. What does it mean to repurpose such, a, such technologies for the uh, dissemination of public knowledge? Or rather than repurposing technologies made for commercial or military contexts, rather than relying on proprietary tools with stringent user restrictions and little concern for the privacy of their users' data, why not make our own? This brings us to our sixth and final manifestation of the smart library as developer of intelligent technologies and infrastructures. The now defunct NYPL labs, the Harvard Library Innovation Labs, 
the Library of Congress's LC Labs, the State Library of New South Wales, DX Lab. I know the other places around the world, like the Rijksmuseum has a lot of stuff going on too in Amsterdam and the tech teams embedded in many university libraries all build public technologies to facilitate the discovery, analysis, and dissemination of knowledge. In recent years, funders like the Ford and New America Foundations have supported work on public interest technology, which some folks argue is just a rebranding of civic tech, um, but, and which is in, in, designed to serve the public good rather than secure a profit. As tech policy analyst uh, Mutalian Conde emphasizes, Public interest tech always attends to the asymmetrical power systems that lead to the weaponizing of technological systems against vulnerable communities, and it aims to minimize those harms. It's important to acknowledge that those alternatives can be modest, local, contextual, scaled to suit the needs and knowledge of particular communities. My friend and colleague Greta Byram, with whom I curated the Privacy and Public exhibition that I showed you a little bit earlier across the various New York City libraries, and who now directs the brand new and very exciting Just Tech program at the Social Science Research Council. She and I, she worked for decades in community tech, collaborating with marginalized and disenfranchised groups, especially those who live in areas that are too remote or not sufficiently profitable to be attractive to commercial internet service providers. Through extensive fieldwork and highly participatory iterative design, Byram and her colleagues in Community Tech New York worked closely with their partners to design networks that embody the values of the community. Their work, quote, looks beyond the value or the goal that is of simply connecting people to the internet, that is beyond access, to ask how purpose-built and community-defined technology can contribute to the well-being and resiliency of communities how connectivity might allow neighbors to organize and address issues like unemployment and environmental health problems and to share local knowledge. Libraries, Greta told me, are so often the most critical digital, uh, sorry, let me start that sentence over. Greta told me, libraries are so often the most critical digital infrastructure in places where we work, both because they provide access to technology and also because they offer digital support and resources in a safe and trusted environment, end quote actually not end quote that goes on. Our central community technology principle is to fit technology to our human relationships, not the other way around. And we work with libraries because they already embody and model this in practice, now end quote. Colin Rinesmith has long been engaged in similar work, which he will continue in collaboration with New York City's libraries and uh, with Metro through his new Digital Equity Research Center at Metro. Many of the principles underlying Byram's and Ryan Smith's work mirror those informing the Detroit Digital um, Justice Coalition, who themselves draw inspiration from the principles of working together developed in the 1991 Pr People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. Those principles link digital access to other forms of social, environmental, and housing justice. They espouse common ownership, alternative energy, recycling and salvaging, and the use of technology to promote environmental solutions. Knowledge infrastructures, they acknowledge, are about so much more than information. They're part of a larger ecosystem of access and equity. Many librarians have explicitly taken up the issue of environmental justice, asking how their collections and services and facilities, and even their institutional practices, including material storage and data um, retention, can promote environmental resilience. As Byram's work demonstrates on a micro scale and as Locke's The Public Media Stack guys aspirations demonstrate at the macro scale, we need to understand how our libraries function as and as part of infrastructural ecologies, as sites where spatial, technological, intellectual, and social infrastructures shape and inform one another. And we must consider how those infrastructures can embody the epistemological, political, economic, and cultural values that cities and communities and towns and villages and hamlets want to define themselves, rather than those imposed by commercial platforms or an oppressive state. To close, let's imagine an abolitionist world in which a portion of the funding that once propped up the prison industrial complex and our municipal data extraction empires was redirected to where it would do the greatest good, and especially for the most marginalized populations, to social services and public infrastructures like schools and libraries, 
Imagine those public infrastructures were further supported by appropriate taxation of commercial digital platforms at other corporations. Media scholar Ethan Zuckerman, in advocating for the creation of an auditable and accountable digital public infrastructure, reminds us of the post office, which had until recently been under grave threat in the United States, but things seem to be turning around now. But it has, in some countries, historically had oversight of telecommunications and public broadcasting. Perhaps we can learn from history and imagine a network of public infrastructures for the creation, storage, and dissemination of public knowledge. Universities, libraries, broadcasting, print media, the postal service, telecommunications, local data intermediaries, and digital infrastructures working together as a public epistemological ecology. Until we get there, perhaps the library can still offer an otherwise, an other world, a space of exception to the commercially and carcerally networked city. A city that today watches and tracks and scores and sorts and meets out reward and punishment inequitably. We could develop useful, productive knowledge and equip ourselves to live critically and consciously among the automated digital systems, while also leaving room for slow and inefficient ideas, for the unexpected, the irrelevant, the irreverent, the odd, and the unexplainable. We could stare back at the surveillance cameras and sensing technologies that are looking at us, reverse engineer the algorithms to determine, that determine what bits and bodies rise up to the top question the technological protocols and legal policies that limit who has access to knowledge. Rather than merely consuming data to feed us via platforms, we could recognize the deep and distributed infrastructures and human intelligences that scaffold our institutions of knowledge and program our values. We could acknowledge the biases and legacies of injustice that still suffuse, suffuse that is, those institutions and work toward their abolition. We could reflect on the environmental impacts of our internet searches and streaming services and blockchains and work to develop practices and tools to minimize our ecological footprints. We could do all these things at the library, but not only there. Rather than building an institution or even a whole society with venture capital and proprietary technical modules manufactured by great men from Dewey and Carnegie to Zuckerberg and Andreessen, we can instead imagine communal spaces public interest technical systems and social contracts that mutually reinforce one another and advance more inclusive and just epistemological and ethical values. A library that uses its infrastructures to care for, maintain and build the rich diversity of public knowledges that already define our cities. Thank you. Hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so many questions, so many things I want to ask. Um, but of course, I'm going to give the floor first to the audience. Um, perhaps in the room, there's a question. You know, we can move to the virtual. Kelly? No? Go ahead. Do you have the microphone? Oh, sorry. Took it away. This, I think. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was just great. You have my head spinning thinking about um, what the kind of in public infrastructural analogs might be in rural areas um, on farms. Um, rural Canada has been like lots, lots of rural America gutted um, in part because of the economic inviability of the, the farm. And so there are very few hospitals, libraries, even schools in rural areas, but I was thinking, you know, in some ways, um, farms themselves and farmers, right, and especially kind of um, knowledge passed among family members, but also encoded in seeds, act as a kind of knowledge repository. Um, and so this is my question, which is, I guess, an invitation. Um, you know, a lot of the projects you mentioned, which all sound very exciting, um, and wonderful driven by a set of values that I can totally get behind, community driven, contextual for public good, uh, critical media and data um, uh, pedagogy, they're, they're still digital. And I guess I, my, my question to you or invitation is, you know, one of the things we wanted with this event was to kind of poke at assumptions that smartness, um, the kind of future orientation and the equation of smartness with digital data. Um, or epistemic systems. And so I guess I'm an invitation to think about 
do you think seeds could be a are a public repository or what? Yeah, just to to, to think about that a little bit. Um, are there projects? And you mentioned a few, but yeah, I guess just an invitation. Sure, and this is probably my uh, maybe um, misinterpretation of what I should be focusing on here. That like, most of my work really talks about how you have to pair the digital and the analog, and looking at the 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 paucity of thinking only about digital or data driven kind of archives and infrastructures. So there's a whole other section of the chapter from which this is drawn, and the work from which this is drawn that looks at the very types of analog repositories, um, kind of embodied ways of knowing that you're talking about. I chose to focus on the digital because I thought that spoke most to the interests of this, this um, conference, but looking not at corporate and state-driven projects, but more community-driven projects. But absolutely, there are um, plenty of examples of analog um, and um, even kind of human humans themselves as repositories. So I wrote a piece maybe five or six years ago about, um, I think it was called the big data of ice, um, um, rocks and mud or something like that. And there I was looking at climate change archives that really draw on coral samples, ice cores, kind of um, sediment samples. So there that's a perfect, a really great example of the big data as in huge collections of, of earth essentially that provide the foundation for a lot of our cl contemporary climate science. Um, I wrote a piece for the Hakeve in Berlin last summer about seed and riverine archives, um, indigenous archives in particular that are embodied in plants and seeds, for instance. Um, you also, lots of people have written it, not a lot, but a good sampling of people, I probably know them because I'm totally into this stuff, have written about the Svalbard, Svalbard Seed Archive as well, which is an example of, you know, um, claiming a, um, a repository, kind of a doomsday repository of biodiversity um, in the Arctic. Uh, so absolutely, there are plenty of examples, and we, again, we can look at kind of feminist epistemology, indigenous epistemology for some great examples of embodied and analog forms of local knowledge that should supplement all the things I've been talking, I talked about in my, sorry, that I focused on in my talk. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess I should, I, you, you reminded me also, there is this Ottawa Seed Library. And um, another, there, there are all these different forms of libraries that are coming up now too. I'm volunteering for the Ottawa Tool Library. So these mm -hmm. um, libraries that are now offering ways to share, not just the tools, but also the knowledge, how to use them and the workshops that they're offering, the, that whole knowledge infrastructure, I guess, that comes with it. Um, and I guess there are also some um, um, crossovers with museums. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, it's you've been mostly talking about libraries, but I, I'm, I'm seeing there is a lot of connections, these, as you said, like these other institutions that are very much um, um, offering this um, public, you know, access or public um, forms of, of knowledge, um, yeah, repositories. Mm -hmm. um, okay, do we have another question? So Naziha, could you read the question? Is Nazia here? Yep. Or could you? Um, yeah, so I'm just going to read the question from Hillary. It says, thank you for the talk, Shannon. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the relationships between the digital and the analog in libraries. How do the infrastructures and knowledge politics of ML and seats compare or relate to one another? OK, I have to read that again to make sure I totally understand. Nazia, can you read the question again? Or maybe Hillary? I'm, I think I'm was... reading it in the chat. I, I can read oh, you're it. Oh, you reading it, yes. sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, so how do the relationships between digital and analog, um, how do the infrastructures and knowledge politics of ML and seeds compare or relate to one another? Um, of ML and seeds. Um, well, I'll give you an example. I'll just draw on the example of the uh, sediment repository that I've wrote about, again, maybe three or I don't even know how many years ago, it was maybe 2017, 18, I published this piece. It's the Lamont Doherty um, uh, campus. It's the Earth Sciences campus of Columbia University, which is across the Hudson River. And um, I don't even know if it's New Jersey or New York, but it's about an hour from where I am right now. Uh, but, but they have, um, as I mentioned, um, coral samples and um, uh, sediment samples from pretty much every body of water in the world close to it. And there, um, 
they, uh, rather than just scanning uh, and extracting data from these samples and discarding the material, because you can imagine it's quite a spatial demand and climate control demand to maintain these collections, these huge um, sample, these huge kind of um, uh, uh, collections of earth. But they keep it because as new technologies, new sensors, new scanners are developed, you can run them through, um, you can run those old samples through. So there are new data being extracted um, through perhaps machine learning, artificial intelligence, new forms of, um, um, of kind of data extraction. As, as new technologies are developed, um, the old earthen samples yield new information. So that's kind of one example of how there's a digital infrastructure that uh, is evolving on top of what seemed to be a, um, a, a, a mothballed um, analog, uh, um, analog collection. Um, furthermore, uh, name uh, another interesting story that I learned in talking to a lot of the geoscientists there who have also then kind of retrained themselves simultaneously as archivists. And some of them do call themselves archivists, even though they didn't go to a library and you know have an LMLIS degree, um, is that they found that there wasn't there weren't uh, consistent naming conventions. So they have multiple core samples that are called essentially like core five, and they could be, they have 20 different core fives. So they have, a, have developed a system and actually spoke to the geochemist who developed this system that is trying to spread it around the world, like a DOI, a digital object identifier, um, that model for geo samples. So there it's developing um, digital systems to allow for the share, global sharing of data and more clear nomenclature and metadata for um, our analog archival collections that were that were harvested well before anybody even knew they would become they would go into an archive. A lot of the early materials that went into this archive were harvested by extraction companies, oil and gas companies, and then bequeathed them to an educational institution. So they were not harvested with the understanding that they would become knowledge um, kind of. Um, embodiments of knowledge for future researchers. Um, so uh, there's a kind of a digital uh, sorry a digital. Um, uh, attempt to atone for that lack of lack of consideration from their kind of original point of origin. So I hope that offers maybe one example of, um, I didn't address seed specifically, but I imagine that some of the examples from the sediments have, apply to things like seed uh, libraries as well. Okay, do we have another question from the audience? Yes, two questions in the room. Hear me? Yeah, okay, fine. Well, first of all, Shannon, thank you for the, the brilliant talk. Um, I was curious about your perception on the, the evolution of the role of these practices that, I, I don't want to say piracy, but uh, those liminal practices that go from, if we're talking in an, like sharing data in an academic slash student context, and those practices that range from students building like a common Google Drive or just sending PDFs to each other, to entire websites uh, that I'm not going to name that are like entire da da databases for articles and, and books. Um, yeah, how do you see the evolution of the role of those agents that can be called from hackers to activists to just the average, average broke students that's trying to access knowledge in, in an academic context? Um, I'm actually quite charmed and inspired by what some people call shadow libraries or pirate libraries, um, memory of the world, um, um, I'm forgetting some of the others, libgen, etc. I will have to say, I liberally make use of them as well when I'm putting together readers from my classes. Yes, I own a copy of the book, but rather than taking an hour to scan it, I will find a digital PDF somewhere and then share that with my students. So I make use of them. And also, um, I'll give you another example of uh, that's not explicitly a, 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 a shadow, um, uh, a, an intentionally built illegal collection. But during the pandemic, um, the Internet Archive, multiple publishers, academic publishers, and multiple libraries, including Metro, the organization that I'm part of that I've spoken about multiple times, all partnered together to create a digital, sorry, an emergency digital library. Um, 
using ebooks um, uh, to make them more readily available, to, especially to university and school students who were, did not have access to the physical, collect, physical collections in their institutions. As you might have heard, this became very controversial because especially um, publishers guilds um, and agents thought this was a violation of their author's copyright. So it went to, I, I don't know exactly the legal details, but um, the end result was that the project was discontinued. They were ordered to do to, to, to cease kind of their practices. So what ultimately, a project that won the um, support and participation of the Internet Archive, which is was built as to be a little bit rogue, but still it's like the closest thing the United States has to a national digital um, National Digital Archive or repos a digital repository, plus multiple very legitimate, highly regarded publishers, both mostly academic, but some trade and multiple libraries, including some of the biggest cities in the country, all signed on to this, recognizing that we have to perhaps um, uh, uh, elasticize our regulations for a while for these exceptional times, but copyright won out. Um, I have to say, I probably, um, I have prioritized open access work and throughout my career, I make all of my work freely available on my website. I make a, I build a website, an open access website for all of my classes. I try to publish in open access venues. Um, right now, I am currently in, involved in a uh, dispute with a copyright troll who found an image I used in a class lesson from three years ago and wants me to pay two hundred thousand dollars for using it in a cl in class. So um, I have my my stance on open access and fair use has just been kind of exacerbated, a grant like um, um, uh, cemented through the frustration of this process. So I'm actually really supportive. Of, I recognize the 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 uh, right of authors, of content creators, of creative practitioners to be compensated for their work. I also um, have really educated myself on the the um, the rights inherent in fair use, and I know that not every country has the same fair use privileges. Um, I've been talking to some Canadian colleagues about some differences between the U.S. and Canada, but um, uh, I think it behooves, especially creative practitioners and academics, to make themselves aware of whatever fair use principles they do have access to within their countries and use them to the fullest and get their institutions to support them too, which mine is not doing, sadly. So I, I'm supportive, but I also, again, recognize the, val the, 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 um, the, the, the value of copyright in um, uh, compensating people who make, who produce knowledge and produce cultural, um, cult make things of cultural value. That sounds like a contradiction, but I think like I, I hold both values um, and kind of in, in tension and productive tension simultaneously, and I'm okay with that. Okay, yeah. uh, we have, sorry, did you wanna add yeah, something? Yeah, I had a follow up, sorry. Um, yeah, there's a huge like legal issue and that as you say, like back home in France during the first confinement also there was this Facebook group that was set up, it was called the uh, Bibliothèque Solidaire, like the solidarity library of the confinement. And people would like ask for books and articles because they couldn't access libraries, of course. And like people that wanted to share the resources, they could not directly post them onto the group. They had to send them through private message because otherwise the group would be like um, banned by, by Facebook. So like you see really the, the really tight legal aspect on those, like even like peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, on this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for the answer. Just one other final note I will add is that I think it's also important to address global inequities. I've been in several kind of library forums where librarians in um, kind of um, knowledge um, uh, knowledge professionals from the global south really call on people from the global north who are better resources to make their resources available to folks in parts of the world who um, can't afford licenses, who don't have access otherwise. So I am uh, totally in support of piracy if it kind of um, creates greater global equity and access to knowledge. Okay, we have another question by Phoebe. Hi, Shannon. Thank you Hi, for Phoebe. this interesting presentation. Um, I'm reflecting on the call that you gave for developing and paying more attention to community driven initiatives to develop these um, data and infrastructure. Um, and I have a lot of appreciation for that perspective. I also taught in this class and this week in my class on rural infrastructure from Christian Sandvig's work on tribal networks. He describes a case in which 
a tribe developed their own network that, with the help of a local university, it ended up being incredibly cutting edge and very well suited to them. But the tribe also said they wished that they didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And they would have preferred to go with a commercial provider because the labor of producing this thing and that they had to put all this work into creating something that everyone else can take for granted is already existing to meet their needs. And I appreciate what you just said about holding multiple values in tension. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which having these forms of infrastructure be something that communities have to develop might be pushing risk and cost to communities that are already marginalized. Yeah, I mean, this echoes a lot of the discussion that's already going, going on around open source communities. or um, So uh, the burden that it places on communities to develop something that actually suits their values but then there's some interesting, more recent research looking at the long-term um, burdens it places on uh, the, the maintainers of those systems. The fact that people burn out, they're, they're not compensated for their labor. It's really hard to maintain an infrastructure, a system that becomes critical, vital to a community when it relies entirely on a core of volunteers. And we might say some similar things about people who have to build their own infrastructures. I see that Greta Byram just put a nice note in the chat. It's nice to know that she's here. She would actually be the perfect person to answer this question. Um, she's the one I was talking about who was the one of the um, uh, central figures in Community Tech New York, working with communities to build their own, build their own internet essentially through, she has mentioned here, the portable, net, um, portable network kits that they had developed. I showed a picture of it too. So, um, uh, I think, again, it's both. It's holding these two values that seem to be intention um, uh, and recognizing the, the values and, and costs of both. Yes, there are, pro there are pluses and that communities can design networks that embody their values. Um, Greta wrote a really lovely piece for an edited collection that I organized a few years ago about um, perhaps communities don't really want 5G. Maybe minimum kind of uh, military second latency is not a concern to them. Maybe it's more equitable access that is prioritized above super fast connectivity. So the, the capacity to build a network that actually embodies what matters to your community, there's something kind of really empowering about that. But then on the flip side, it does then um, obligate that community to maintain something that otherwise could be outsourced or kind of you could rely on a state or a corporation to, to do that for you. Okay, hey, thank you so much. Um, we're at the end of the um, talk, um, and I would like to keep it in time and um, have um, a short break for everyone, for people online, as well as um, people here in the room. Um, Shannon, it was a wonderful presentation and um, very generative conversations that we just had now in the Q&A. It's brought up even more questions for me and, and ideas of what to do next for our project um, on, on small scale farming and the use of digital technologies that we're doing, Kelly and I and um, um, some of our colleagues. Um, so thank you so much once again. And um, I hope you can join us for the rest of the day. And uh, we look forward to our next panel that will start at 10.15 um, Eastern time. Thank you so much. <laughs>